mother is more than I can tell. I hope that we may all see each other again. The first time that I see you, I will tell you more than I can think of now. Be a good girl. So, goodbye. Amos Humiston bleeds to death. No identification. The fear of dying anonymously haunts troops on both sides. Some sew their names into their uniforms. Dog tags are still 40 years away. By the war's end, 400,000 soldiers will be missing in action. We really cannot imagine the scale of death, the scale of suffering. No one could have imagined carnage on that scale. Day two at Gettysburg brings more devastation and a daring all-out rebel assault. At stake, victory at Gettysburg and maybe the Civil War. Gettysburg, day two, 12 p.m. The rebels are on the move. They're planning a surprise attack by 14,500 troops. Their mission, break the Union stranglehold on the high ground by outflanking Meade's fisher. The goal of the Confederates on July 2nd is to find the Union left, damage, destroy it, and roll up it, and unhinge the entire Union position and win the Battle of Gettysburg. Leading one rebel unit, Brigadier General William Barksdale. Pro-slavery, pro-secession, Southern patriot, hometown Columbus, Mississippi. Barksdale was a man who took the ideas of the Confederacy and pursued them with raw aggressiveness, with a, a, a unfettered hatred for the Yankees. But there's a problem. The land ahead of him was not scouted. Because Lee's cavalry is missing. They're 12 miles to the south raiding supplies. The cavalry the eyes and ears of an army is no longer in communication with Lee. Lee is blind on the battlefield and that means that he doesn't know what the Union is up to. And that of course is going to cripple any army. Without cavalry to guide them, the rebel troops nearly march into plain sight of a Union position. Barksdale, and the entire attack have to find another route. A costly delay adding two hours to their march. Time that lets me reinforce his defenses. People often ask me, what if they had machine guns in the Civil War? I always say, forget all that. One set of walkie-talkies could have changed the outcome of the Civil War. Three miles away, George Meade also has a problem. Just three days on the job, he's lost telegraph contact with Washington, D.C. Invented 25 years earlier, the telegraph is changing the way the Civil War battles are fought. President Abraham Lincoln, a hands-on commander-in-chief, likes rapid news from the field. The Signal Corps usually runs temporary lines to his generals at the front. But at Gettysburg, the field equipment hasn't arrived. And rebel forces have cut the lines. During the whole thing, he's got to be thinking, Lee has beaten us time and time and time again. And if he does it here, there's no one standing between him and the Capitol. We're it. He can't lose. To issue orders to the front, Meade uses a new innovation based on Morse code. 
wigwag signal. Waving the flags forms letters, like the dots and dashes of code. It works. Meade tracks the rebels' movements and responds with his own. Meanwhile, on Culp's Hill, Rufus Dawes waits with what's left of his Iron Brigade unit. Yesterday, they routed the rebels at the railroad cut. Today, they're with 11,500 men defending the fish hook's right flank. Stretching over three miles, Meade's fish hook is formidable. Heavy defenses along the high ground make the Union line almost impenetrable as long as troops stay in position. But one Union commander isn't following Meade's orders. Major General Dan Sickles, wealthy, devious, a rogue. Recently acquitted of murdering his wife's lover using the first plea of temporary insanity in U.S. history, he'll leave Gettysburg even more notorious. Dan Sickles was all about Dan Sickles. If it didn't benefit or aid Dan Sickles, he wasn't very interested uh, in it. He didn't go to West Point. He didn't have any military experience, but he was able to use his money, influence, and power to raise his own regiment. Against Meade's orders, Sickles moves his third corps too far forward, fracturing the fish hook and leaving the flanks exposed. A blunder that could cost the Union the battle and maybe the war. After hours of delay, the rebel force finally arrives in position. But Lee's lost the element of surprise. The Union knows what's coming. Until Dawes hears the assault begin. At this hour, the storm of battle suddenly broke out. Artillery and musketry thundered and crashed together. Wave after wave, rebel troops launch one of the epic assaults of the Civil War. Barksdale is about to get the fight he's always won, but is ordered to hold his ground. William Barksdale is ready to go. He's chomping at the bit, but he has to wait a little longer. The plan is to take 10 Confederate brigades and attack with them two at a time. One brigade striking the enemy. Then 15 or 30 minutes later, the next one strikes the enemy, and then the next and the next. Fights that are now burned into the pages of American history. Devil's Den, Little Round Top the wheat field, the peach orchard, and Cemetery Ridge. Barksdale can see that Sickles' mistake has left the Union vulnerable, creating the South's best chance for victory. But he is still under orders to hold his men back.
Sixty minutes pass, but Barksdale's regiment still waits. The rebel yell fills the air. Each unit has a unique sound. Fierce, savage, terrifying. With Barksdale, Private Joseph Lord, 21 years old, laborer, hometown, Big Oak, Mississippi. Carrying the colors makes him a prized target for Union sharpshooters. start of the initial attacks, Barksdale and his men are finally unleashed. They storm into enemy fire racing towards Sickle's position. What happens next could change the course of the war. With adrenaline, sure of their cause, William Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade are finally attacking. Oh, his 1,600 men are part of a massive offensive. 21,000 troops attacking Meade's line from Little Round Top to Cemetery Ridge. An all-out assault to win the Civil War now. Barksdale's mission break through Union defenses on Cemetery Ridge. Opportunity lies right in his path. Against orders, Union General Dan Sickles moved his third corps out of position. They're now vulnerable, perfect targets for Barksdale and his men. If Barksdale, as well as other Confederate brigades nearby, are able to exploit the gap in the Union line, it would be calamitous for the Union Army. The Army would be cut in two. Barksdale's troops are unstoppable, overwhelming Sickles men. Their defenses start to collapse. Meade's entire line could be next. William Barksdale, his troops hit the Yankees like a hammer. He rolls over those Union troops, captures several hundred, if not more than that, of the Union troops, and continues on in several directions towards Cemetery Ridge. Watching from Culp's Hill, Rufus Dawes knows the Army of the Potomac's in trouble. We could plainly see that our troops were giving ground. Thousands were streaming to the rear. Our suspense and anxiety were intense. The rebel line was advancing. The rebel yell was predominant. Lee's offensive is working. If it succeeds, he could win the knockout victory he seeks. Meade has no choice. He pulls 8,000 reinforcements from Culp's Hill to repel the rebels. 